ఈ దమ్ ఫ్రెండ్స్ సో వి ఆర్ డిస్కసింగ్ కగ్గ విసాన సుత్ యాజ్ థీమ్ ఫర్ దిస్ మైండ్ ఫుల్నెస్ ఫర్ యంగ్ అడల్ సెషన్ అండ్ వి స్టార్టెడ్ దట్ సుత్ ఆన్ లాస్ట్ వీక్ అండ్ వీ కవర్డ్ ద ఫస్ట్ వర్స్ అండ్ బేసికలీ ఆల్ దీస్ వర్సెస్ ఆర్ అటెడ్ బై ద బుద్ధ and as a request of anand venerable anand and that is how uh, the commentary explains but there are different views as well but anyway uh, buddha spoken these uh, many verses uh, explaining about the some uh, secluded life of a maybe a monastic or especially especially here about the pacheka buddhas you know that there are three levels of uh, attainment basically so the supreme attain- attainment that is the uh, self enlightened enlightened buddha samma sambuddha and then this pacheka buddha and uh, he also self enlightened but he is unable to explain the dhamma in detail so that the others uh, can't have the full understanding about the attainment attaining nibbana and the third level is the uh, shravakas or the disciples of the uh, fully enlightened samma sambuddha and they have various capacities some have the capacity to explain others the dhamma what they have realized and some may not have to the same level so likewise variations are there now in this kagga vithana sutta the theme is that uh, these various pacheka buddhas are spending a secluded life and uh, they are uh, what is the main uh, reason for their attainment so this is how they are explained one after the other and each verse actually have a beautiful uh, story behind it and all these stories are explained in the commentary and the main uh, canon that is the sutta nipata only has the verse and the explanation is given in the commentary now we have discussed the first verse last time and so therefore i directly go to the second verse so second verse starts like this samanka jana sansag jatas భవంతి స్నేహ స్నేహం వ్యయం దుఃఖమిదం పహోతి ఆదీనవం స్నేహజం పెక్కమాను ఏకో చరే ఖగ్గ విసాన కప్పు సో దిస్ బ్యూటిఫుల్ ఇన్సిడెంట్ హెపెండ్ లాంగ్ టైమ్ గో అండ్ దిస్ పచ్చేక బుద్ధ ఆల్సో హ్యాస్ బోర్న్ డ్యూరింగ్ ద బుద్ధ కాసప్ యు నో దట్ బిఫోర్ అవర్ బుద్ధ ద గౌతమ బుద్ధ there was few more buddhas in this uh, bhadra kapp uh, so one is the maha kasapa the kasapa buddha so there is during this blessed one kasapa this particular pacheka buddha has born as a uh, layman and then he also entered the uh, sasana and there he has spent lot of time and uh, maintaining ascetic practices it is mentioned about 20000 years he has spent uh, developing these ascetic practices and he was able to attain first jhana and using which he has got the fortune to uh, reappear in the brahma realm so he spent there a long time and uh, after being there for a long time and again now he has born to the king baranasi king of the baranasi and uh, now he is a little prince but there's a big difference in this little prince that he doesn't like women so this is a beautiful story so you can imagine what has happened so this little king doesn't like women now therefore even if he is uh, crying and if he has to be fondled if he have to given even the breastfeeding so the males have to come so what they did was 
tactfully they disguised uh, as males and they come and they feed <clears throat> even the that is how they have fed this little prince and he is not uh, willing to be with the women rather he likes to be with men and therefore he doesn't like the smell of the women so it, therefore it is he, he is being uh, called as anitti gandha prince anitti gandha kumar or anitti gandha the prince called anitti gandha non order of women so he doesn't like the order of women so therefore he is called anitti gandha kumar so he likes on me the men to uh, take care of him anyway as he is growing now he was able to again attain first jhana and he is now spending a fairly a pleasant life and when the time comes so his parents this uh, king and the queen thought that this uh, son needs to get married so he they actually ask him but he doesn't like he doesn't want to get married but you know this parents actually want him to get married because they have the kingdom and the whole uh, resources and all the king everything is there for him therefore they like their son to get married so what they did was that they were trying to persuade him for getting married and uh, they tried to use certain ministers to convince him but none nothing has fruit, become fruitful then ultimately they asked in if you want to get married what is the kind of beauty what is the kind of level of the woman that you need so then what he did was he made a kind of a trick that uh, he asked the best uh, uh, sculptors to come and they uh, they were asked to prepare a very beautiful woman's uh, sculpture so that's a very beautiful woman culture and you can't find a woman closer to that it is so beautiful extremely beautiful now as a challenge so this prince is telling so if i am getting this kind of a woman so beautiful this kind of a woman as you can see from this golden uh, statue if i am getting this kind of a woman then i am going to marry so this is the kind of a trick that uh, he is playing he thought that they may never find such a woman so then by the way the parents the king and the queen were thinking that our son is so fortunate so there should be a, such a beautiful woman uh, available for him in this uh, area so they asked several brahmins to come and they have handed over the women's uh, statue to them and asked them to find out in visiting various cities and uh, finding out such a beautiful uh, princess for this prince now they were going from city to city finding out and uh, they were unable to find out but ultimately they have gone to a madurata and it's a kind of a area and they are they actually have found a girl for who is more beautiful than even this statue golden statue actually what they did was they have kept this statue closer to a river and uh, then certain women approached the river to getting bathed and all these things and uh, they found that their princess have come before them and then they understood she is not the not their real princess rather it's a statue then this conversation was heard by those brahmins and they asked where is your princess and then with their help so they have gone to the palace and that king was convinced that uh, our king the is looking for this kind of a princess and so they were able to convince her them now the brahmin have sent the uh, message to the king that we have found a princess for our prince so what are you going to do are you going to come here and arrange a wedding here so do you want us to bring the princess to your kingdom so they are asking they were sending a message 
then actually the message has gone even to the prince so he was thinking that they may never find uh, such a woman but now the prince also got the message that they were able to find such a beautiful girl beautiful beautiful princess now actually there is lust arisen in his mind because he was imagining that there is a, this is the kind of prince that i am going to marry this is the beauty that she is having so he has some sort of a imagined uh, picture in his mind and now he was able to fulfill it as a result of that now he is somewhat burning with lust and so he put an order so ask them to carry this uh, princess as much as as quickly as possible now what happened was the message has gone back to the uh, brahmins and they were asked to carry this princess as quickly as possible so they actually have given enough wealth and all the things to the parents of that princess and they were able to convince them and now they are coming quickly back to the city of that prince that varanasi now they are arriving now since they were ordered to come quickly and for long this distance without stop they were coming 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 so it's a long journey so and they actually reached the varanasi and now they stop now it's a long journey and it's quite tiresome you know like today they didn't have highway so any of those so it's a, a tiresome path so they have to go through this uh, horse carts and uh, with all these troubles now the whole day traveling and ultimately what happens so this princess was a very gentle woman and she was not exposed to this kind of a tiresome job this long distance traveling and ultimately what happens because of the jolting of the vehicle and the tiresome uh, journey so she become fairly fatigued and ultimately she couldn't bear it and she actually died now the message has gone to the prince that the princess so beautiful and he was eagerly looking forward and searching for has found but ultimately when she reached the the city of baranasi she has died now it was a shock to the prince because he was with the so much of uh, uh, attachment and he was thinking about her and he was imagining about her and all those fantasizing and all these things are going on in his mind now ultimately the whole thing collapses all his uh, you know the expectations all the love he has everything collapses now what has happened then so then actually he understood then actually once he was so sorrowful and he was so unhappy he was almost like collapsed and then he was thinking back what is the reason for this much of sorrow arising in the mind what is the exact reason so there he understood so this close affection so this too much attachment is the one making this whole sorrow so if you have extremely close affection towards someone so if something happens if that person dies if that if you have to get separated then you can't even bear it so this prince actually recognized it he understood it so now he is recognizing the causes what are the causes for this much of sorrow this much of lamentation what is the real cause and then he is understanding okay there is a kind of an attachment so in my mind so this is the cause so likewise he is understanding the cause of the suffering so that is the attachment that is the desire so as he is recognizing more and more about this desire now he is able to let go of the desire and at the same time he is able to understand more and more causal reaction or the causal uh, chain dependence available in this whole uh, situation so when there is clinging when there is sort of grasping 
So then the the sorrow is inevitable. So if something happens because the situations are very vulnerable, so therefore every time when there is a strong attachment, strong grasping, it causes lamentation, sorrow, despair and all this uh, suffering. And he is searching more. He is actually introverted. I mean, he is introspection and he is uh, putting Yoniso Manasikara and trying to understand more subtle causes. Then he understood, okay, there's a desire in me. Now I have a kind of a desire for this uh, princess. So I have imagined her uh, beauty and there's a desire. So he understood the desire. So why this desire happens? So it is because of the feeling. So when, they are, when I am thinking about her, there's a very uh, pleasant feeling arising in me. So this is the feeling. So how the feelings arising? That is because of the contact. So my mind get engaged with various fantasies, various imagined, uh, say, images and uh, situations. And that actually causes a lot of happiness. So this happiness, this pleasure, these pleasurable feelings are the cause for that craving, attachment, desire. So he is further and further drilling down and recognizing the subtle causes. Then he understood, okay, this feeling happens because of the contact. So the mind gets contact with all these imaginations, all these proliferations, all these mental images. So that is where the contact happens. So that is the, the mind. That's a, this is the faculty. This is a kind of a reflective reflection available in the mind. So this is the faculty level that it is working. So there are eight faculties, seven, six faculties, mind, body, eye, ear, nose, tongue, like that. So he is carefully scrutinizing, carefully observing, and he is carefully recognizing each and every link of this, of this dependent arising. So likewise he is going little by little to the backward and he is understanding what are the earlier causes for these five, six senses. So then he is recognizing, okay, there is a kind of an imagined situation. There is a kind of a reflection going on in the mind. So mind is occupied with various, say, mental images. Mind is occupied with various name and form. So in today's terms, if we are explaining, so the consciousness and name and form have kind of an interrelationship. So this intelligent prince now is understanding all these causes. As he is moving forward, so he understood there is an ignorance. So ignorance is causing a lot of fabrications, a lot of formations. It is causing the consciousness and name and form to come into contact, to operate in a cordial manner, interrelationship and it is causes, causing the faculties to get activated and it causes the contact, contact causes feelings and if those feelings are quite pressurable, there is a desire for those feelings, craving for those feelings and once it is growing, then there is the grasping and when the grasping is there, so there is a mind-made fantasy, mind-made conceptualized world so that world get collapsed. So that causes suffering. So likewise he is re reflecting on this Paricca Samuppada, this dependent arising, uh, forward and backward, ascending order and the descending order. So with this kind of a practice, now he was able to attain Pacheka Buddha. He has become a Pacheka Buddha. Now, so once he has become the Pacheka Buddha and... Uh, the other people didn't know that now he has become a Pacheka Buddha. Now they are asking him to not to get worried because of the departure of this uh, princess. So they are, they are asking him not to get worried. And now he is telling that I am not worried. I am now have completely eradicated the causes of being worried. So and I have become a Pacheka Buddha. And he is now uttering this verse. To the audience. Sansagga jatasya bhavanti sneha. So when there is a bond, when there is a close affection, and uh, there, there are the, when there is a 
close affection, there's a kind of a bond is there. So when you have sort of an affection, there is a bonding. And sneha sneha vyan dukkha midang pahoti. So that affection can bring suffering. And adinavang sneha jang pekkamano. And when one understands the danger there, so danger of this affection. So once he understood that, so now he is trying to be alone without allowing your mind, allowing his mind to get for that kind of a suffering. So this is the kind of a theme of this story, this Pacheka Buddha is telling. So the close affection, if one is having, so that can lead to immense amount of suffering. So you know it is not a secret that all of us may have a lot of uh, close relationships, intimate relationships and we may have love affairs and many things are there. So various situations were there. So if there's a kind of a breakout happens, if there is any relationship breaking out happens, so you, you have extreme suffering, your heart start to burn. So you feel your whole world has uh, collapsed and you get utterly disappointed and the other party might have neglected you that also can make you really suffer and probably neglecting you he or she has gone with someone else so that also can cause a lot of suffering and on the other hand he or she might encounter kind of a disease so unexpected, un, unexpected uh, disease so that might have caused kind of a bad situation. He or she might have quickly passed away, met with an accident. So likewise, when we have close affection with the person, so there is a kind of a danger there because in any kind of a situation, the other party, the other person can meet with maybe an accident or kind of a change of his mind. So likewise, many issues are there. So therefore, this Pacheka Buddha is seen that danger. So he recognized that danger. So therefore he is mentioning Adinavang Sneha Jang Pekkamano. So by recognizing those dangers, so he is now trying to be alone without going for any kind of intimate relationship, without going, going to have a close affection with anyone. He is trying to be independent. He is trying to be alone. So this is the theme that uh, comes under this uh, verse and under this actually there are several levels of affection and the close companionship is explained in the commentary. The first one is the dasana where how a bonding happens. Say you are seeing a particular person again and again. Suppose you are going to work and there's a beautiful girl, maybe a handsome boy and you start to have kind of a affection because of this scene. Again and again you see that particular person. She is beautiful, she is pretty and she is behaving very pleasant. So you get a kind of a click in your mind. Similarly the other side also can happen. So likewise this scene can cause this kind of an affection. This kind of a bond. So you get kind of a bond in the mind. So you get a kind of an attachment in the mind. So once you come back home, so you start to think about that person. So I have seen that girl while I am walking, while I am traveling, okay, while I am working. So likewise, you start to generate various thoughts in your mind. Now you are going to various fantasies, going to proliferation. And the other side is the savanna, that you have heard someone. Maybe someone is singing, someone is talking, Okay, someone has given you an unexpected call. The other party on the other side is uh, talking very pleasant. So your mind get attached to that. Or your mind get attracted to that. Because Buddha has mentioned for men, this women's sight, sounds and their behavior and their appearance and that is the best uh, form that the man's mind get attracted. Similarly, for women, 
the sights, sounds, smells, the behavior of men are the main attraction. So this is happening you know, both sides, happens to both sides. So here therefore Buddha mentioned, so either through the sights this attraction can happen, either through the sounds this attraction can happen, and again through the uh, bodily relationship, say you are touching, uh, kissing or all these relationships are going, intimate relationships are going on, so the affection is happening, the bonding happens, a close attachment going to happen. And then maybe having a conversation, so you are having a friendly conversation. At the beginning probably you may start a kind of an official talk, discussing a particular matter, or okay, maybe starting a typical topic of the country a kind of a situation in the whole world. Now you are sharing your thoughts. Now you find kind of attractive points the other part is talking. So you get attracted to that. And then the the conversation become longer and longer. And you like to have conversation with that particular person. So he so you are inviting him or her to have another conversation. So let's meet on the other day. So next day at this particular time let's have a little chat. So this is how we start because we like that conversation. This is a kind of an attractive conversation is there. So we, we give enough reasons to uh, justify this conversation. So we are having starting this conversation. Now it is going on and on. So once come back home also you may be given giving a call and again you are continuing and you like this conversation. So this conversation also cause this affection, also cause this bonding, close attachment. And probably you may even share certain resources. Say you didn't have your say laptop, so you borrow someone else's laptop. So the person who lend you the laptop may be a beautiful girl, maybe a handsome boy, so he feels quite generous, so you get attracted to this. So you start to appreciate his or her generosity. You start to appreciate his uh, demeanor and his behavior, his politeness, his manners. So likewise various points are there. So how we get involved, how we get attracted, how we develop this kind of a relationship and how we start this kind of a close <clears throat> intimate relationship. So these are actually mentioned and explained and this is how our mind get hooked up, our mind get attracted, our mind develops sort of bonds between the other parties with their opposite sex. So this actually leads to attachment. When the attachment is there, there's a kind of a strong relationship, strong bondage in the mind. So in case now the other person met with an accident or met with a kind of a sudden change, completely change the mind <clears throat> or someone or he or she has completely changed the mind and given word to someone else. So what happened to you? So you may face kind of booted, you may feel sort of uh, <clears throat> collapsed and you feel that your whole world has destroyed and you may even feel like committing suicide. But here fortunately <clears throat> this person, this Pacheka Buddha uh, was quite uh, fortunate person, he has his uh, previous good karma and he has his uh, good understanding. So rather than he committing suicide or he is continuing to become sorrowful, what he understood, he, he actually reflected back. So when suffering is there, Buddha mentioned, there are two sides, two outcomes. One outcome is become crazy that you understand, okay, the other party has met with an accident. So you become completely uh, sorrow, lamentation, and ultimately one can even become crazy. The other side is the search, investigation. So this is what this person has done. So when the sorrow is arising in the mind, so he investigated, what is the exact reason for this sorrow? He is now finding out various causes. So this is the wise approach. So all these breakages, all these booting, all these separations, those are actually inevitable in our lives. They may happen at many, many different times. 
So when such things happen, rather than become bewildered by that, rather than become overwhelmed by that, so if we are able to recognize this suffering, if we are able to recognize our own, say, sorrow, lamentation, and now recognizing the causes for that suffering. So what is the exact cause? And what are the other supporting causes? Then we are doing wise reflection. Yoniso Manasikara. So this is what the method uh, this uh, Pacheka Buddha has done. So this uh, the bad fortune, actually he has, he was able to turn to the benefit of his spiritual side. So he has turned this completely bad accident, misfortunate accident, unfortunate accident to the benefit of his spiritual side. So rather than he committing suicide, instead he tried why this sorrow has happened in this mind. It's a, it's a wise reflection. So with that he was able to reflect the uh, this causal reaction, dependency, and as a result, he was able to practice vipassana and then he was able to completely uproot all the desires, craving available in the mind. So when the complete craving is eradicated, uprooted, so he was able to attain the craving-free state of mind, tanha kaya, that is the nibbana. So this is how he has attained the pacheka buddhahood and so he is explaining his uh, way of uh, attainment. So with that, actually, I like to conclude uh, today's uh, Dhamma sermon. Now I like to open the session for questions. How oh, Tenwan Sanai? We have five questions today. Yeah. So we can't see your face. Uh, let me see your face. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> First question is a general question. Yeah. Uh, it has a, a medical term, so I hope I pronounce it properly. Uh, dear Venerable Bhante, would you please be able to elaborate on epistemological suicide? <laughs> so today, today I also mentioned about the suicide. Now you are asking epistemological suicide. <laughs> Interesting. So actually, our Lopusai Nasi used to say this uh, quite often. So this epistemological suicide. So actually, uh, there are different ways that we can explain this. So you know, uh, what we have is not a real self. So what we really have is a mind-made self. So first of all, if we have this understanding, then it is easy. So it, it is not a real substantial self that we all have rather what we have is a mind made self because of our ignorance we are making a self then and there we are making a self so this is a very uh, interesting and very deep understanding of the vipassana so i making and mind making i making and mind making happens then and there say for example you did a kind of a marvelous job. So everybody started to praise you, everybody applaud, and uh, so you have become the star at that time. Now suppose the event has finished and now you are coming back home. So while at home, so various thoughts are coming, thinking about that incident. So how you did that, how the others have applauded, how the others have praised. So likewise now many thoughts are coming making a self now you are making a self because others have made you a good person or kind of a appreciating person and uh, say uh, say uh, star whatever it is so likewise what happens is this whole situation helps to make a person helps to make an individual helps to make a self so this is how the second thought or the proliferation thinking is helping to make a self. Or on the other hand, we may even think about our belongings. So I have this, I have that. So these are my belongings. I have this much of money in my bank account. 
this is my mother, this is my father, this is my son, this is my daughter, this is my husband, this is my wife, this is my job. So I am thinking about all these belongings. So they are, those are also helpings to make a self. So likewise, we are continuously making a self. So this is how we actually have this self-view. So through Vipassana what we do is after having fair amount of mindfulness and you have a lot of understanding about the nature of the phenomena where you recognize through your own direct knowledge that things are impermanent, they are quite transient, they are constantly subject to change and there is nothing substantial, there is no inner core, everything is basically empty. So you have this understanding, the Vipassana knowledges are there with you and whenever that self-making happens in the mind, there you are trying to disclaim rather than promoting that self-view, rather than promoting that self-appropriation. So you do some sort of disclaiming. So this is called epistemological suicide where you have very good understanding, intellectual understanding is also there, that you know that there is no any substantial self, a person, individual, rather these thoughts are trying to construct a self through their, those kind of uh, ignorant thinking and you are now trying to discard that thinking. You are trying to disregard that thinking. You understand the say futile nature of that thinking. So this is, this is in a way we are trying to, in a way we can say it's a kind of a committing suicide but actually it's uh, not exactly like that because there is no person to get commit suicide. Now if there is a substantial self to get annihilated, we can say it is a kind of a committing suicide, kind of a self annihilation. But if there is no real self, it's, if it is the, what we have is a constructed self, what we have is a mind-made self, then there is no person to get, get committed suicide. But anyway, from an outside point of view, one can interpret that we are doing some sort of a epistemological suicide. But anyway, Buddha didn't mention like that. What Buddha has mentioned is that eye-making and mind-making has to be recognized. So you are recognizing then and there how the mind is trying to trick us to create a self, to construct a self to fabricate a self. So you are, you are, you, you recognize this fabrication, you recognize this construction and you understand its futile nature and then you simply become mindful and simply disclaim it. So as you do that, what happens is the frequency of this eye making and mind making become less and less. Say for example, when you are not developing mindfulness, when you are not developing vipassana, so quite often you may do this eye making and mind making again and again. So each and every aspect you are making a self. You have a lot of conceit. You are quite proud and you are quite possessive. So likewise, there's a huge self, mind, mind, mind made self is there. But as you uh, develop Vipassana and you have good knowledge about the whole thing and when you know things as they truly are, so this mind-made self start to become diluted. So it start to become, uh, say, vague. And it is not a solid one. It's not a concrete one. Rather, you understand it is, it is not there is a real self available. Rather, because of the ignorance, because of avijja, so there is a mind-made self. Yeah. You can move forward. Uh, question number two of six, uh, this is a general question. Dear Venerable Bhante, in sitting or walking or on daily activities, I have heard we should allow things to happen and not deliberately make things happen. During my sitting practice, how can I distinguishly identify between things that happen naturally and things I make happen? For example, in the stillness, if a lot of thoughts come and I know it, knowingly dwell on one, is this deliberate or natural? 
much appreciate your advice and guidance with Metta. That's the end of the question. Yeah. Uh, so actually when a thought happens in the mind, so it may have some sort of an attractive nature and uh, so our, without our knowledge, we may get attracted. We may get pulled in. So then we are sort of involving in uh, sort of thinking. So there we can't say it is kind of deliberate thinking, but we can say it is a kind of a habitual thinking. So actually we need to recognize this habitual thinking. So habitual thinking ultimately become kind of a proliferation and we become sort of victim of this whole thinking process. But uh, at the beginning we might do some sort of deliberate thinking as well. Actually it is very beautifully mentioned in the Madhupindika Sutta of Majjimunikaya where it is explained by Mahakachana Mahatero, the Arahant Mahakachana. Uh, so he mentioned that when the I and uh, form uh, are in line, so the I consciousness happens. So there is a knowing of the object, there is a knowing of the form. This is how the sight happens. So when that is there, because of the contact coming all these three together, so there is a feeling. Suppose you have seen your son. You have seen your husband, you have seen your wife, you have seen your daughter. So there's a there's a pleasurable feeling. So now you recognize this. Okay, this is so and so. So there's this recognition. So as when the recognition is there, so now starts the thinking. So now you are thinking, oh, whether he has had his uh, meals, whether he has done uh, homework, or whether he has had... Uh, uh, say good sleep or whether he had a kind of a quarrel with someone so likewise you start to think now that is kind of a deliberate thinking so we actually involve there so we are the ones initiating that thinking but later what happens now the habitual thinking start to intervene and we think from this side we think from that side we think from the past we thinking from the future planning, daydreaming, fantasizing uh, with eyes, ears, nose, everything is now connected and ultimately become it's a huge mess and it's a kind of an obsession now and now it is not that we are deliberately thinking rather the thinking machine has started and we become kind of a victim of that thinking. So therefore we can say so the early, very early stages are common to even arahants. So they are kind of causal reaction is there. Causal effects are there. On top of that, we start to think. That is deliberate thinking. And later, what happens is, we don't stop there. We don't apply brakes there. As a result, thinking is going on and on. Ultimately, it becomes kind of obsessive thinking. And then it is not, uh, it's basically beyond our control. Now the proliferation is going on. So we become sort of a victim of that whole process. Yeah. Question number three of faith. Uh, this is Michael Walking. Dear Bhante, this is regarding a technique I use when the mind is not settled and getting distracted during my walking practice. Some days I find it difficult to focus on the sole of the foot and observe subtle and discontinuous sensations. During these times, it, it, it is much easier to focus on the walking process itself. Example, the way joints move in the lower legs and how the weight transfer as a continuous process. This seems to be more seamless than the noting technique of left and right. After some time, I can get back to the subtle spot observation. Even though this works for me, I don't know the validity of the technique. I'm trying to advise my children who practice with me and thought of checking with you before proposing them with this option to try. Much merits for your valuable advice. That's the other question. Yeah. Uh, so actually both aspects are there when it comes to mindfulness practice. So this uh, minimalistic approach where you are trying to uh, focus on uh, one small aspect and recognizing that uh, minute information is also there. On the other hand, if you have the kind of broader view 
and kind of a uh, overview of the whole situation that is also there so so you can change it so you can have a overview kind of broader um, mindfulness aspect sometimes we call them as call it as macro mindfulness and on the other hand you can have the kind of minimalistic view where the very refined the ref detail the finer details very focused uh, information so that is also there the kind of micro mindfulness is there so you can use both aspects so i mean uh, depending on the situation you can switch between these two so having the overview of the whole situation is one aspect of the mindfulness and having very scrutinized detail is another aspect of mindfulness and both both of these categories are available so therefore both are valid ways of uh, practice and time to time you can switch between these two there is no harm question number 4 of 7 this is on mindful sitting dear bante i have been practicing a few years under your guidance and here is a short reflection of my recent sitting session i do not have a specific object of mindfulness and try to observe whatever is prominent usually it is the sitting posture or the small movements and vibrations in the body sometimes rising and falling of the abdomen sometimes the breath even though i started strictly observing the breath and sticking with it for more than 2 to 3 years i start focusing on the body the observations around the posture and feeling the comfort of sitting then i go to observe one of the objects mentioned above and after 4 to 5 minutes of continuous application of mindful observation the sensations fade away reaching to a much more relaxed free state of mind there are not much demarcations around the sensations at this state and some new phenomenon arises as well as sleepiness mind distractions to thoughts single proliferation streams of thought arising as coming through an open flood gate etc i have written several reflections on these and i got valuable feedback from bhante There is no issue observing these new phenomena, which are when they are present, and count them under wider mindfulness awareness. From the body-based processes observations to this all-in-one spacious mindful state, I haven't spent much time on feelings or thoughts during the last three to four years. Practice as a technique. Neither I have put. specific attention to rising and disappearing nature of the objects which come into my radar to vary my practice a bit i was thinking of paying more attention to the feeling uh, the comfort pain and neutral feeling observation or pay more attention on the rising and disappearing nature of anything which comes by appreciate if bante can give some guidance and the technique for the next steps much merit for your valuable advice yeah yeah since you have uh, uh, recognized that you are capable now to understand the appearing and disappearing nature of anything so applying that technique i feel is much fruitful actually all these have, i mean the techniques are valid and uh, you can select a particular uh, group of uh, phenomena and there you can understand the rising and falling sorry rising and passing away appearance and disappearance but without having that sort of a selected group overall whatever arising so you are understanding okay they have the nature to arise and they have the nature to passing away and uh, you can actually refer there is the beautiful sutta called uh, kinsu kopama sutta so they are uh, buddha mentioned this so they are actually different people have used different approaches have taken different approaches some have some have actually used uh, to the bodily phenomena like you do dhatu manasikara various uh, element characteristics one have used and uh, they are trying to uh, uh, sort of generate wisdom through them <clears throat> some have used various uh, faculties so using that they are trying to develop wisdom some have used the you know the aggregates skandha and using that they are trying to develop uh, say wisdom so certain others actually without having that sort of a discrimination so whatever the condition phenomena whenever either it could be feeling it could be element characteristic it could be a mental 
a thought, mental state. So you can, so they actually have a kind of a, a broader perspective and they are trying to recognize how these arising and passing away nature is common to all these conditioned phenomena. So that is, I mean, if you can uh, move forward in that approach, so that is also welcome, no harm. And that is acceptable and that is also is quite a fruitful and a beneficial uh, approach. So therefore you can continue in that, that way. Yeah. Question number five of seven. Uh, this is really <coughs> number seven. Thank you for sharing your experience and practical tips to overcome the biggest problem of practicing mindfulness at the beginning, forgetting to be mindful. The method of using sticky notes to remind to be mindful seems quite effective at home. I have put small stickers in the mirrors and doors to remind me whenever I see them to be mindful of the activity I'm doing at that point. Also want to check with Bhante if there are any practical things we can do to be mindful in the office where we spend most of our day, at least 8 hours every day. Sticky notes seem not practical for this scenario. I can think of setting up a short vibration alarm in the phone every hour. I have heard that this is the same or one of the reasons to sound the gong every hour in temples of some Thai and Chinese tradition. Maybe set a set maybe a set of short reminders on Outlook calendar might work in my scenario. Thank you for your valuable insights and the guidance you provide. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. So basically, I mean, it is not only I am, I mean, describing or recommending, but even the, you know, uh, actually recently I have to change my uh, spectacles. So when, <laughs> when I went there, so they actually advised me, don't look at the computer continuously. So with each 20 minutes, try to look at some far object and again, come back to uh, the screen again after 20 minutes you have to look at something far available and then you have to look at far. So that is good for your eyes. So otherwise we end up with dry eyes because the computer screen is quite, uh, uh, you know, you are extremely concentrated there and it is there are many attractive things and maybe you are using your lot of brain power. So you, without your knowledge, so you lose the, uh, you know, the blinking of the eyes. So therefore you become, you, you strain your eyes. So therefore they advise even that. So on the other hand, so time to time earning ourselves is most important. So I mean continuously if we are, con I mean holding all these uh, attachments, all these uh, troubles, problems in our mind, so then the mind get really exhausted. So time to time we have to keep it aside. So that's a beautiful uh, story from uh, uh, Ajahn Brahmanso. So he is taking uh, this kind of a cup. So he is asking to hold it for two hours without keeping it on the table. What do you think? So it becomes kind of a troublesome. I mean, it is not that heavy, but holding it for long time, say three hours, four hours, five hours continuously, start to aches your hand then simply what you need to do is to keep it on the table and relax your hand maybe you can do little exercise and uh, kind of a relaxation stretching and after a while again you can pick it back again you can uh, now hold it so as he mentioned so it is similar to our day-to-day -day troubles day-to-day -day problems or day-to-day -day whatever the activities that we get involved with so if we are uh, trying to hold them in our mind for mind for a long time, so it generates a lot of stress. It generates a lot of uh, burden into the mind. So therefore, time to time we have to put it aside and close our eyes and uh, come back to the breath, come back to ourselves, come back to the say our body, to our posture, because it is so this incident or this scenario is extremely simple compared to the problem that you have in your hand say you are th thinking about the situation at your office so you have to plan something you have to design something it's a really mind consuming brain consuming resource consuming task you get really fed up you get strained so 
assume that you simply switch off or rather say sleep your laptop your computer and you simply close your eyes and you relax and spend one minute so that's a very good practice so that you can uh, sort of energize yourself you can break the cycle the vicious cycle and you can actually keep aside that uh, say what a cup the big problem and you can again rejuvenate yourself so now you have uh, again you were able to regain energy and you can have a fresh look to your problem so therefore uh, as you have mentioned so you can have such kind of a mechanism available in your outlook or in any other reminders for you to time to time informing you okay this is the time to relax this is the time to let go this is the time for a small break so likewise you are having time to time uh, kind of uh, small breaks and at that time you are fully relaxing you forget everything completely let go of everything and you fully enjoy that present moment just the direct experience that very ordinary experience you are now trying to enjoy discarding all that conceptual thinking intellectual thinking so you stop yourself just come back to the direct experience that is quite important yeah question number 6 of 7 is again related to the dhamma sermon dear venerable bhante in the dhamma talk today the prince did not get a chance to see or hear or be with the princess but gatha says he was uh, you mentioned uh, the but the gatha says uh, he was able to you mentioned bhante that seeing hearing smelling etc for the cause of love i feel he did not see the princess yeah he was getting chance <laughs> yeah 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 so but i mean that is the that is the princess uh, inferential knowledge <laughs> so you don't need to have all the experiences for you to uh, explain it so once he become the pacheka buddha so now he is elaborating that all these possibilities are there so he actually have heard about the passing away of the beautiful princess taken for him but he didn't even i don't know i i was not there in the scene so to check whether <laughs> whether he has really seen the dead body anyway so he understood i mean through the hearing also you get the affection through the sight also one can get the affection okay through the say sharing of certain things you get the affection okay you get the direct touch through the direct touch the bodily touch also you one get the affection and through the conversation also one get the affection so these are in a way common sense and it is understandable to everyone so therefore he is giving a kind of a, a generalized uh, approach to what has happened to him yeah uh okay we just uh, come to 8 o'clock but uh, there's one more question is it okay by yeah yeah fine fine yeah. So that's the last question. It's again on the Dhamma Sermon. Dear Bhante, when sorrow arises, is it wise to invoke the investigation, investigative and yoni so manasakara nature of the mind as highlighted in today's Dhamma Sermon? To do this type of wise reflection, isn't it necessary to have a pre-trained, well-developed mindfulness? Is this not questioning the ability of the present one? but from our perspective we will not be able to get into any type of reflection without pre developed mindfulness this method that is the question no actually uh, that is true i mean we we i mean when this kind of a tragedy happens to us we may not be able to attain the pachaka buddha hood that is that is true but the point is uh, say when this kind of thing happens that in certain other suttas buddha mention that there are two possibilities one possibility is that you start to think you start to become sorrowful you start to lament and uh, you trying to ask help from others you become drunk and all these things likewise that you become insane you become crazy so that is one approach that uh, some people are taking on the other hand buddha mentioned suffering causes search suffering causes investigation 
So as you mentioned that you may not be able to immediately understand the causal relationship, immediately understand the Padisamupada because those are quite deep. But at least you start to recognize, you start to understand there's a problem in me. I mean, I, have, I am suffering. I need, how I am able to overcome this suffering? Now there's a question. Now there's a kind of an investigation. Self-quest is there. So with that urge, now you are going to someone else. Say, now you are asking, how, how, how are you going to help me? So assume that in today's terms that you are going to a counsellor. So you are asking from another person, you approach another friend or you are going to the temple or you are asking from whatever, whoever it is that you believe that some, some solution can be given. So you approach that person. So this is the quest. So this is the investigation. So then assume that the other person is helping you, he is trying to convince you, he is trying to sort of generalize the problem. It is not only to you that I have also have faced this kind of situation and other person also have faced this kind of situation. So he is now trying to show the sort of inevitability of the problem, uh, this kind of a situation. Now he is trying to convince you, help you and to guide you in the uh, removing of this sorrow and now you are somewhat recovered now you are getting to say mindfulness practice it's a kind of a stepwise process so therefore in today's terms in our situation so this is the kind of a situation so there are many cases so after this kind of a <clears throat> say tragic accident or any kind of a say calamity so people start to search so what are the possibilities other possibilities available so how I can become happy, how I can overcome this sorrow, how I can overcome this lamentation, rather than simply, say, uh, continuously engulfed in this uh, unhappiness, this sorrowful, pathetic situation, how I can overcome this sorrow, how I can again recover myself. So that is a positive approach. So it may not be immediately possible to investigate as you said the kind of what is the samupada and all these deep dhamma but slowly you may approach to some uh, spiritual quest and to some other various ways and means to overcome that sorrow and lamentation and uh, so that would be the practical approach yeah. so uh, i think we've come to the end of the program and finished all the questions so i'd like to uh, conclude the program First, I'd like to thank Bhante for joining us and giving up his valuable time for this program every week. And uh, especially to Nirupa for starting off and hosting the program today. Uh, Jatha is not with us, I had any questions. So, um, and also everyone who participated and uh, put through the questions so that uh, we can continue this program. So, uh, I'd like to end the program and thank you for coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.